Welcome to the Australian Prescriber Podcast. Australian Prescriber, independent, peer review, and free. Hi, and welcome to this Australian Prescriber Podcast. I'm Dr. Justin Coleman, a GP on the Tiwi Islands north of Darwin, and author of the RACGP Choosing Wisely Recommendations Around Use of Antibiotics in General Practice. When I was a first-year Melbourne Uni med student sometime last millennium, our ancient microbiology lecturer made about the only truly exciting announcement of his course, inviting us each to come down the front and pick up a free book. That book was the original Antibiotic Guidelines, which I believe was the first ever publication from the Therapeutic Guidelines series, now known as ETG, although, of course, the E didn't exist back in those days. But move forward 33 years and ETG has become a publishing phenomenon and someone has invented podcasts and I give you not a free book but a free 15 minutes listening to what's new in the 16th version of that same book. Now back in 1987, we thought that antibiotic resistance was a quirky beta lactamase thing that some bugs had figured out in response to penicillin but now antibiotic stewardship will no doubt dominate today's discussion. And in fact, today, my expert guest is a steward extraordinaire, Dr. Kirsty Busing. And Kirsty is an infectious diseases physician at Royal Melbourne Hospital and deputy director of the National Centre for Antimicrobial Stewardship. So welcome, Kirsty. Thanks, Justin. It's good to be with you. For the first time ever, I think it won't be a published book. Um, it will be an online book. And I think that is reflective of the way things are moving these days. It's live evidence and it gives the chance to update things more rapidly rather than having to wait. And I guess with antibiotics, it changes almost as fast as any other field. Yes, that's right. I mean, I mean, bugs are uh, evolved, don't they? And 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 the the epidemiology of the types of infections that we're seeing, or the new challenges that come along from an infection point of view, are constantly evolving. Um, and I guess in addition to that, there's new evidence being published all the time. Yes. Well, sadly, I've actually thrown out about three house moves ago my original copy, but it's now probably a collector's item. It that's would a be. pity, but. Your expertise is on um, stewardship of antibiotics. Well, I call them antibiotics, antimicrobials, I guess. And there are some strategies at the start of the book talking about the fact that we should specify the duration of therapy and default to not giving repeats. And I, I do tell my registrars when they come to the practice to make sure the software automatically defaults to no repeats for antibiotics. Because I think really to give an antibiotic repeat should be an active decision made with the patient in front of you. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you're on top of this. Um, the whole broader view of stewardship is that we treat antibiotics as a precious resource and we use them judiciously. We use them when we really need them. And, and when we really need them, we use the duration that there's evidence to say we need to use. And, and we try to avoid unnecessary doses. So, and one of the, the things in the new version of the therapeutic guidelines is the authorship group have been really careful to specify the evidence-based duration that's required for each of the indications that are in there and shorter durations are in trials having um, equal efficacy to some of the old traditional durations that might have been just based on the fact that there were seven days in a week or ten fingers on our hands. I've never actually thought of that, but I, I like it. You know, the Bible has 12s in it and hands have 10 in it and weeks have 7 yeah. in it and they do <laughs> tend to be often the, the number of antibiotics in a packet. Uh, one thing that strikes me when you mention that is when, when I do talk to or write an article often about uh, antibiotic use, a lot of GPs do come back and say, well, you know, in the end it's the agricultural industry that uh, is responsible for the resistance and so what we do is a drop in the Ocean. I guess in, in the role that I have in the National Centre for Antimicrobial Stewardship, we're a One Health uh, research group. So and that means that we have animal health experts working alongside human health experts. And so I've learned a lot about animal health antibiotic use. And, and I think the important learning there is that 
in the broader context, Australian food industry and, and veterinarians uh, are not prescribing huge volumes of antimicrobial drugs. In fact, relative to the rest of the world, we're, we're a very low prescriber. The classes of drugs that are being used there in general are not are certainly not high-risk drugs that we are, are very dependent on in, in human health. So I think we've we've moved beyond that finger pointing back and forward of, of vets blaming doctors and doctors blaming vets and just saying, look, collectively, we all live in one world and we all acknowledge that antimicrobial resistance transmits from animals to humans to the environment and we've got to work collaboratively around this and all of us value the precious resource that antimicrobials are. Dr. Kirsty Busing, I like you already. You've got that we are one, that collective feel. And I, I think you're right. It is something we can only all tackle together. So let's move off the bigger picture down to more specifics now. So at, about what's new in this these guidelines and how some of these things play out in clinical practice with the person in front of us. And we'll start with respiratory infections. Um, and there's a section there which has been updated on pharyngitis and tonsillitis. In fact, there's a number of things in the respiratory tract where evidence comes out that, in fact, if you don't use antibiotics, people still often tend to get better. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In the in the pharyngitis space, um, a recognition that the vast majority of cases are viral and will get better with anti- antibiotics and that even, even in those that may well be caused by bacteria that most of them will still improve without specific antibiotic therapy. Um, the recognition that bronchitis is one of the really common conditions that people will present to a GP with and ask the question, do you think I need some antimicrobials? And we came to understand that, in fact, the previous versions of the therapeutic guidelines hadn't really addressed bronchitis very well and that it probably deserved some dedicated information there. So it's typical for the cough to go on for two or three weeks. And, and so that, that idea that, oh, if the cough's there for more than a week, I might need some antibiotics probably doesn't hold true. The recognition that the vast majority are indeed caused by viral infections. Some recommendations about symptomatic management of, of the cough in bronchitis um, to give people information about something they can do to help themselves feel better with it, without needing to reach for an antibiotic. What I found quite helpful too was some description around how you might differentiate clinically bronchitis from pneumonia. Some simple things, breathlessness is is far more likely in pneumonia, whereas in um, bronchitis it's predominantly cough, which may or may not be productive of sputum and may or may not be accompanied by wheeze. But but once a patient's starting to have trouble breathing and getting breathless, you, you know, the clinician might start to think this could be pneumonia. People with pneumonia may have tachycardia at rest or tachypnea at rest, whereas patients with bronchitis really shouldn't have that. Then there's the the clinical examination of the chest and an appreciation that people with bronchitis, while they can have crepitations, that if you get them to take a big breath, um, that those creps will generally clear, whereas uh, fixed crepitations that that aren't changing with respiration make you much more anxious that the person might have pneumonia. We well and truly appreciate that that not everyone in general practice needs to be sent for a chest x-ray. Sorry, I'd go so far there as to say that most with respiratory infections shouldn't have a chest x-ray because yeah. I think that would be poor practice uh, in, in general practice. If, if there's no suggestion that they are sick enough to need to go to hospital. Sure, sure. I think it's very important those words and terminology because I know as a GP you feel when you type in the notes, if you use a word like chest infection, you, there's sort of this implication that you then should do something about it. So it's sort of nice to be able to have that bronchitis does have that implication that it's viral. In the same way as many years ago, if you wrote pharyngitis, you felt that if you didn't give an antibiotic, someone would come back and look at your notes and say, well, you've said they've got pharyngitis and now why aren't you giving an antibiotic? So I think the naming is quite important. Yeah, yeah. I sort of think about it in my mind when I'm thinking about bronchitis, I'm thinking it's the airways, whereas when I'm thinking about pneumonia, I'm thinking it's the alveoli full of fluid or pus. I think a classic is uh, acute otitis media where in the past someone would have been horrified if you ever saw a red bulging drum or something and didn't use an antibiotic. They would consider you almost negligent. But I think, you know, some of the Scandinavian countries led the way cutting down on antibiotic use for that. And Australia certainly caught up 
over the last perhaps 10 years or so. Certainly infants need it and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So where I work, we do use plenty of antibiotics for otitis media, uh, which overlaps hugely with chronicity, chronic ear problems, and other, other children at high risk of complications. But for kids who are you know older than two years and systemically not too unwell, can still have a fever, I think there's more and more move towards not using an antibiotic. Completely agree with you. So I think I think the guidelines for a lot of conditions are moving toward giving permission for clinicians to say, watch and wait, and that the vast majority of these will get better by themselves. And regardless of whether or not whether they're viral or bacterial, indeed, some of these, you know, they're, they're probably mixed pathogenesis in, in a lot of these. But if you sit tight, that it, the vast majority of these kids will get better in two or three days. And it's giving GPs and parents the permission to not jump in there with antibiotics. I guess you highlighted the Scandinavian countries in in the antimicrobial stewardship world. We sort of hold them up as the countries that have led the way and and where they really manage to reduce antibiotic consumption is in interestingly, in children less than five years of age. So, you know, there's a a strong suspicion that we do overuse antibiotics, particularly in those little kids. They are the medical world's heroes, aren't they, those Scandinavians? Thank goodness we can still be better at them at at surfing and cricket or something like that. But there's also the emerging concept of shared decision-making because I guess a lot of these things aren't really black and white. It's not as if we could ever really say, look, um, in this instance, 0% of people will need an antibiotic and in this instance, 100% Mm. will. Often there's pros and cons depending on the individual. Mm. Uh, The therapeutic guidelines have have provided some hyperlinks to some tools that GPs may find helpful to guide the discussion that they might be having with a a patient or or their family, their parents. You know, medicine's not perfect and no clinician can make an absolute guarantee that this person does or does not need antibiotics. But these shared decision-making tools just lay a little bit of that information out explicitly on on the screen or if you choose to print them out, it'd be on paper that you can sit with your patient and guide them through. Yes, and we're even moving away from necessarily having a black and white virus versus bacteria talking in the um, ulcer and wound guidelines, we were talking about that swabbing an ulcer or the muck that's popping out of an ulcer almost always grows some sort of bacteria, but it doesn't necessarily mean there you have to use an antibiotic. And I noticed with acute sinusitis, it's not necessarily so important, this specific question, are there any bacteria in the sinus? What's important is what is the difference in the outcome One of the things I get quite interested in is explaining the natural history of an illness to a patient because I think if they're empowered, they know what to expect, they're much less likely to panic and to to want a tablet um, that, you know, may be completely unnecessary. And and importantly, I'm, I'm sure you found, Justin, because I've certainly found with my patients that a lot of them are concerned about not only the short term but also the potential long term uh, impact of taking antibiotics. Some of them do worry about, you know, what's happening to my good bacteria and patients become more cognizant of the fact that antibiotics are not harmless. You know, that, that idea that, um, oh, it won't hurt. Yeah. And I think it's a credit to various members of the medical profession that that conversation has got out there in the public arena. I did want to move on now to cystitis, so urine infections. In my knowledge, you know, it was one of the first ones ever where it was shown that, for example, three days of antibiotics in an uncomplicated urine infection was every bit as good as uh, seven days. And some of the studies have come out to go even further than that and saying we don't always need an antibiotic at all. Is that yeah, right? so there were, there were a couple of really interesting papers from Europe um, in recent years that uh, took Young women um, without other complications, so so you know not pregnant and not unwell in with other comorbidities, and just looked at whether it was a safe thing to do not to give them antibiotics when they presented with uncomplicated cystitis. And in fact, there was very little difference in the rate of symptom improvement and and the rate of progression to pyelonephritis. You know, if she has an episode of cystitis and you don't give her antibiotics, the likelihood that she'll progress to pyelonephritis is actually really really low. It was something in the order of uh, one or two percent from from memory. So, you know, it's it's not an unsafe thing to do. 
So in terms of the treatment of cystitis or urine infections, have there been any changes to the first line antibiotics used? So the first line antibiotic recommended is still trimethoprim. I, I am aware and, and GPs probably have noticed that there is a rate of resistance in the community amongst our common E. coli and it probably runs at roughly about 20%. But but for a condition that is a reasonably low risk condition, we still think that about that 80% likelihood of empirically covering the pathogen is a very reasonable first line recommendation. But interestingly, the second line recommendation has now become nitrofurantoin. That's a drug that fell out of favour because of of side effects that occurred when it was used long term for patients as a prophylactic drug. Those side effects are very, very unlikely, extremely, extraordinarily rare if it's used for the very short five-day course that's needed for acute cystitis. And susceptibility to nitrofurantone has been really well retained amongst the urinary pathogens. Keflexin and amoxicillin clavulanate have really dropped out of first-line recommendations for cystitis. Gosh, nitrofurantoin, I feel personally proud for that maintaining its impact because I can't remember using it for yeah. many years, but clearly I will be going to it more now. I'm talking with Dr. Kirsty Busing, the infectious diseases physician at RMH in Melbourne. And one of your particular areas of interest is in penicillin allergy and penicillin hypersensitivity. And I do notice that also crops up with some new teachings in this 16th edition of antibiotic guidelines. Can you talk us through that? Sure. Um, I guess there's been increasing interest in the area of penicillin hypersensitivity in recent years. And I guess it's driven by a recognition that penicillin allergy labels are actually really common. It leads to people not getting first line recommended treatment, which is usually the treatment that has the best evidence and the most likelihood of efficacy. And instead, they're going to second or third line treatment. So it's a bad thing to have a penicillin allergy label. There's been recognition that oftentimes they're applied to patients who've actually only had side effects of the medication rather than an allergic reaction. So people who tell you they're allergic and then when you question them, it turns out they had nausea or diarrhea or a headache or something. In those situations, we really want to encourage all clinicians to do is to remove the label of penicillin allergy from them so that they can have first class, first choice drugs. But for that group that do have an allergy, a true allergy, there's some more nuanced discussion around the different types of allergy. There can be immediate or delayed reactions and that there can be severe or non-severe reactions and that the risks of exposing people to penicillins or penicillin-like drugs are categorised in the new guidelines based on, on those four categories. I agree. It's very frustrating um, when people have a possible penicillin allergy from 40 years ago and it really limits our prescribing ever since. I also think one of the issues is the prescribing software we have, which tends to only allow an allergy or not. Dr. Kirsty Busing, thank you very much for your comments as we together make the world a better place and try to help individuals while not increasing the antibiotic resistance around the traps. Thanks, Justin. My guests' views are their own and don't represent Australian prescriber, and my views are certainly all mine.